Hey everybody, how's it going? Thank you for joining me this evening. I've got a great guest that I think you guys are all going to enjoy. Uh, many of you have probably seen Pete's show before, but if you haven't, make sure to check out the links below. He's got a lot of links, so I just went ahead and, and got his link tree so that you could get everything uh, in one convenient spot. But that's uh, down there for you. Pete, thanks for coming on. No problem. Um, <laughs> thanks for asking me to come on. You've been gracious enough to... Uh be on my show a few times so i feel honored yeah no it's it has been awesome i've really enjoyed our conversations have been really interesting um and you have a lot of great guests a lot of a lot of crossover between kind of our interests and and then you have a lot of people i wasn't aware of so it's it's your show is definitely great and people should should absolutely check that out and, and you've been kind enough to have me on a number of times but i wanted to invite you on because uh one you know one of the things about uh, you know, being on your own show is sometimes people don't actually kind of hear you, you know, cause you're, you're a great interviewer. You're talking to people, you're letting them express things and then go on at length. And so sometimes people don't get to kind of hear the full story from, from your side. And also I think you're going through a journey in a lot of ways that I think a lot of my audience and people in my circles are going through or have gone through or are thinking about and so I thought that uh, people would really uh, enjoy kind of hearing from you in that perspective, because I think it's a place a lot of people are. Um, so I was hoping you could just, you know, I always start the same way. Just tell me a little bit of how you got started. How did you get, were you always interested in politics? Were you, were you always interested in kind of broadcasting or hosting a show or these things that you kind of, you know, uh, worked into eventually? How, how did that work? No, politics came later in life. I I've only ever voted three times in my life and you know, one the last one was for Ron Paul and the primary was in 2008 so you know, I really haven't had any interest in politics uh, I mean I have interest in politics but not like electoral politics uh, before that I mean I had some red pill moments um, I discovered the uh, Institute for uh, historic review in like 1999 and i started falling down a rabbit hole if anybody remembers them it's kind of hard now to to find their their website it's like a secret url um so yeah, that was familiar. like yeah that, that was one thing and um that really turned my world upside down then i started that caused me to start questioning a lot of things in reality and then you know nine eleven happens and you're just like, oh, what the hell's going on here? No one, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know what to make of this anymore. And I just struggled for a bunch of years until you know Ron. I saw Ron Paul during the debates in two thousand seven, and foreign policy had been something I had been following, and he seemed to make the most sense. When it came to foreign policy and everybody wanted to fight him on it and i figured well all these people who i really despise are fighting him you know maybe there's something to what he's saying so i started looking into it and you know i started studying libertarian theory right about there and did for about three years and then stopped for about five years and did some self-study on a couple other subjects and then right around the time you know, Trump started his whole circus. I started getting back into what was going on. I started reading again, got a refresher course and, you know, just basically started posting on the internet and posting a lot of memes and things like that. And July, 2017, I'm like, I mean, I know how to operate a microphone. I used to, you know, I used to be in a band and, you know, I, yeah, let's, try this podcasting thing and um it, july will be five years and it took me four to be able to build up enough of an audience and enough support to work myself out of a job and do this full time but um yeah but you know the um i guess 2019 i started asking some questions you know whether the term libertarian was any was even useful anymore because people just have this when they hear it they automatically think of something leftist and i didn't think i was a leftist at that point 
but you know, then I had Paul Gottfried on a couple of times and started going down a rabbit hole. And then the um, COVID hit and I just started questioning everything that I knew. And I was just like, well, looking around and listening to what libertarians have to say. And, you know, a lot of libertarians, including myself, got it right. I mean, in February of 2020, I was basically saying what was going to happen and predicted a lot a lot of what happened over the last couple of years. But you know, as a couple of months after that wore on, I was just like, well, there's no solution to this. You know, I can I can describe what's happening, but I can't. I have no answers and nothing that I've studied in libertarianism has an answer to to what's happening. So I, I need to look elsewhere. And um, you know, I started reading Moldbug again. People had sent me, you know, Curtis's writings from UR in the past and I just wasn't ready. It wasn't the right time. And then I just started reading and just going through the whole the whole catalog and got in touch with Curtis and asked him to come on the show. And that pretty much sent me down down a spiral that um has gotten me turned me into persona non grata in a lot of libertarian circles. So yeah, and I definitely want to explore uh, that part, you know, where you've kind of taken that turn. But let's go back a little bit, because I think it was interesting that you had mentioned that really foreign policy had been the thing that turned you on to libertarianism, when so often it starts with the kind of the economic theory. So had you always been, what was it the foreign policy that then kind of led you to libertarian economics? Or is that something that you were already kind of in tune with? How did those things jive together? Did you find those arguments compelling once you kind of stumbled upon them? Yeah, well, you know, I'm old, so I remember the Cold War. You know, I re I remember me and my girlfriend at the time sitting there um, the night that the wall they started tearing apart the wall in Berlin, and you know it. It's funny, there. there's this whole thing about how the Cold War ends and Pat Buchanan and Murray Rothbard are like, all right, let's become isolationists, concentrate on the uh, on what's, you know, what's going on at home. And then, of course, the neocons stepped in and um, you know, started to screw everything up, looking for looking for another demon to fight. And, um, you know, when once 9-11 hit the then my the whole thing about you know all through the 90s i didn't really think about foreign policy and then when 9 11 hit then i had a friend who i worked with at the time who like had all the background on Os osama bin laden and he's telling me all this stuff and everything so through the 2000s it really you know the, the foreign policy bothered me because i knew that i could recognize the propaganda for WMDs in Iraq, uh, just from the studies that people I had known who were in the military, who worked with propaganda units and had told me things to look for um, before that. And it just, it, it seemed like propaganda to me, but I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know how to, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to bash it, you know, I don't, we got to support the troops and everything like that. And then, you know, that after about 2004, I just dropped out and came back in and looked at, see, see what was going on every once in a while. And then in 2007, that Ron Paul moment sort of clicked foreign policy for me. And then I just went down a rabbit hole of reading his old speeches on the house floor. And that helped me to understand foreign policy more. And then once I got a handle on that, then I started picking up the economics books and going down the economics rabbit hole and um, getting my basics in Austrian economics all set up. Yeah, see, that's interesting way to come at that, because, of course, I was very much a very normie Republican GOP. And so when I was looking at libertarianism, I still kind of had this neocon foreign policy you know, framework that's that's what I was thinking about. So I didn't find that portion of libertarianism compelling, 
But of course, when you're kind of in the Republican milieu, uh, milieu it kind of the, the economics makes sense, right? They kind of dovetail with your understanding of, of the free market and, and corporations and all those things. And so that portion of, of libertarianism makes sense. And then the part that's attractive for people who are kind of coming at it from the GOP side is, well, we keep losing these culture wars. We, we haven't really been able to do anything here. And so the best thing we can really do is just get government out of things, right? Like, so we're never going to control government. It's never going to be in our favor. We're never going to win these battles. So the best thing we can do is just kind of try to, to, to get government out of them entirely and leave us alone and kind of carve out our own thing and, and do that on our own. And so those are two very different ways to kind of end up looking at libertarianism as an option, but in either case, they kind of, they kind of draw you in that direction. And I think that it, that's why libertarianism is very alluring, especially to a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of disaffected uh, young men uh, in particular, because it just gives you the option to kind of be left alone, not have demands made on you uh, and, and be able to like kind of strike out and do your own thing. And you feel like, well, that's something I can do, right? Like I, I, I'm making money for the first time. I don't have a lot of responsibilities. I, I you know, I, I'm not built, you know, kind of built into a community yet that where I'm like have deep roots. And so I kind of feel like this laissez-faire live and let live option is available to me. Was any of that, uh, a, you know, part of uh, why you were interested or what, did it remain kind of mainly the foreign policy aspect? Well, I think for me, once I started going down the economics rabbit hole and then I started going down the theory of like what a libertarian society would look like, it just clicked my autism. You know, it's just like you're well, I don't I just have to be right, you know, it, it, and I just have to be right in theory. And I think that libertarianism is very safe to a lot of people because they're not operating within the realm of reality. Mm -hmm. They're. You know, they're everything to them is theory. And I mean, this is theory that in these people's great, 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 great grandchildren's lifetimes is not going to be implemented. So I, you know, the culture war was another thing for me. I remember I was on Dave Smith's part of the problem. This was like at the ending of 2017, I think, or the beginning of 2018. And I told them, I said, you know, I think that the reason why a lot of people like to fight the culture war is because it's easier to fight like a purple haired college student than it is the state. Well, <laughs> then I start reading books outside of libertarianism and I start and I realize, oh, OK, well, it's all one and the same. That's and right. These it, are the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is the same thing. You know, it's like you will see libertarians make this statement online every single day. They will say to people like me now, you hate the left more than the state. Then you hate the state. And I'm like, it's the same thing. It's I don't. How, how are you not getting that? It's the same thing. I mean, and I understand how they're not getting it. It took me you know, a long time to get it. But I, you know, I don't know how libertarianism didn't become something completely different as soon as COVID started, because myself and a whole bunch of other people saw exactly what was happening right from the start yet. And we started talking about it and just talking about it. And my, my audience went up 75, I mean, it was like 75% in a matter of months because it was all I was talking about and I was getting a lot right. And, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't, under, I don't understand how people just like, there are still people online, right? There are people online right now on Facebook, on Twitter that are arguing over how many libertarians can dance on the head of a pin in Ankapistan. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Are, what are you doing? You know, I mean, do you, have you not seen what has happened in the last 26 months? And if you haven't, I mean, as somebody who lived, who was an adult when 9-11 happened and watched the Patriot Act happen, watched all of these, all of these agencies get, get condensed into one. I mean, I was, I was floored by what, by what was happening at, at that time. And I immediately said, I mean, I was saying this. It had to be in March of 2020. 
this is 10 times worse than 9-11. And libertarians didn't have an answer to 9-11 other than, well, you know, we, we shouldn't be going picking picking fights and everything. Well, I know we shouldn't be going and picking fights. Sure, that's that makes a lot of sense. But, okay, how do you get them to stop? Oh, you don't have an answer for that. The, I'm, <laughs> this, this has been my frustration the whole time. And, I mean, I get, I mean, I, I've been sent like things from private groups about stuff that's been said about me over the last couple of days because one of my friends in Michigan like left the LP and left the Mises caucus. And he said, I was the one who it was because of me. And then I'm just watching these people like who actually think that like the libertarian party is going to somehow even crack, put a crack in the foundation of what's been built and i'm i just don't know what to say to these people anymore so it's i mean a lot of people came on the ride with me and a, a lot of people a lot of libertarians they don't call themselves libertarians anymore and you know i mean i still think some of the economics is really good and i think there are some good principles there but i mean as far as you know i mean i remember hearing somebody say that um libertarianism was, was like astrology for white men <laughs> and it's like literally that's and it's almost basically what it is it's what it, the way the way it's presented um by people online and you know people say well you, you know if it's not one of the leaders of libertarianism saying it i'm like no no one's paying when somebody's online and they're seeing libertarians go at it, it's not the leaders of libertarian uh, libertarianism. It's some woman who's talking about the six abortions she had, you know, and how abortion has to, you know, the libertarian position on abortion is, you know, on demand. You know, th that's what people see. That's people's perception of it, you know? And uh, I happen to think that, you know, I still like a lot of what Hoppe has written, and I think there's still a, an incredible amount of value in, in what Hoppe has to say and what he's taught. And I think some of it's actually useful, but it's, yeah, I mean, you know, somebody in the chats here saying Ron Paul is still based though. Sure. Cause Ron Paul is oper operating in reality. Yeah. I mean, Ron Paul has said it all along. Anarchism isn't going to work. He goes, not now, you know? So yeah, I mean, Ron Paul is still somebody great to talk to, although, you know, it's, I don't know that there are, I don't know that anybody has any solutions right now, short of, you know, flipping the table. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that you know, I ran into a similar thing with kind of the GOP and the, the my constitution crowd, you know, I, I, I always deeply believe that when, you know, the, when things really hit the fan, like, even though I saw all the problems that were kind of occurring and why we couldn't win battles and, and things on the Republican side, I always felt like when, you know, when push came to shove and we really started running into, like, you know, uh, tyranny, that people would rally around the Constitution, that, that the Bill of Rights would be like a bulwark, you know, that, that, that yeah, we will let things erode here and there. But when when really it comes down to it, there's going to be a, that there's going to be a here and no further and covid broke that for me right like i th that's where i was try i was making an argument to one of my friends back when i had a facebook of like well if the constitution you know if the if the if constitution was going to stop this if the bill of rights is going to stop this isn't this the time like wouldn't this be how this goes down and this guy who's you know very republican very active in the gop i think he ran for something at some point was was very much uh you know very involved and and really believed it and he was just equivocating equivocating on everything no no that's not what it means no no that's not how it works no 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 there's there's one more thing there's we have to do it this way we have to listen to the you know experts on this or whatever and that just broke me. I was like, okay, so this is never going to work. Like, there's you're never the, the like you're never going to go for the mat to the mat for this. And you are not like just one person. Like, this is the kind of the majority opinion. Like, you're you're far from the only. This is what I'm hearing from everybody. And so, uh, you know, again, a, a different 
angle on that, but a very similar experience of like, you have no functional solutions for this. Like you have a theory about how this is going to work and how these things are going to be protected. But when this really happens, there's, it's just, you know, all, there's always an out. And, and I think with, like you're saying with libertarianism, it, one thing about it is it's so hard to really pin down and define, you know, like I, I think, you know, I've said before, you know, Greg Gutfeld and, you know, Bill Maher and Noam Chomsky all called themselves libertarians at the same time. Right. And so it's like, what, what does this ideology even mean? You know, what does this, when you're trying to present this to people, what does it even do? And I mean, so, yeah. And, and so it's just very hard to, to, to kind of hold the idea of libertarianism accountable because it means so many things to so many people, because I think leave me alone means so many things to so many people. Right. Like, uh, and, and so like you're saying for a lot of people, it's just, you know, the, the, the face of this stuff is just degeneracy, just, you know, people screaming at the, at the top of the lungs, I should be free to, to do this. But then at the same time, you've got guys like Hoppe and I didn't know about Hoppe until I had already read Moldbug and the juvenile. So when I got to Hoppe, it was kind of like, you know, it was funny because because Hoppe borrows a bunch of the juvenile and Moldbug borrows a bunch of both. And so <laughs> I was like, OK, I, I've yeah, I know this. I know this song like I've heard this cover. Yeah, like I it, but but he opens up a lot of very interesting things to it. So so he, I think even though I'm not a libertarian, I got a lot out of reading Hoppe. And so I think uh, th that's really valuable. And that kind of libertarianism, while I still think is flawed like you said, has very valuable things and has a lot of predictive power. So, but, but that's such a small percentage of, of what people actually think of as libertarianism. And so I, I think any idea of it as a movement is kind of doomed from the start because there's simply, there's no place for you to like generate any kind, there's no shelling point in libertarianism other than, like you said, kind of like yelling into the void about the state. Yeah. And that only goes so far, you know, when, when you're looking around and you're seeing people's lives absolutely being destroyed because of, you know, a virus and people are lining up to wear masks and they're lining up to get jabs. And I mean, <laughs> You know, I, I started openly just like, OK, how does what's the answer? What's the libertarian answer for this? And, you know, and I had the, the one pro, the one thing that was said to me that just said, OK, I'm not a libertarian anymore is, well, libertarianism is an ought. And I'm like, that's all. Thank you. That's all I need to know. That's that's all I need to know. And. Yeah, you know, the whole. You know, when you look at live in, the whole live and let live part of it and how that is everybody's perception of libertarianism. And then, you know, I had you on the show to talk about, you know, the path from the Enlightenment to, you know, drag queen story hour. And it's like, yeah, I mean, there are libertarians that will argue that if you are against drag queen story hour for any other reason, then it's in a public library then, you know, you don't believe in freedom. And we've seen it over the past couple of days, too, watching libertarians argue, hey, hey, it's a woman's right to choose. I mean, I've always thought it was murder. Even when I wasn't really, you know, even when I didn't believe in God, I thought it was murder. So it's like, <laughs> I can make the argument. I, I can make anti-abortion arguments from six or seven different directions because I've given it that much thought. But the whole idea that you know, oh, it's it's a woman's body; she can choose. Oh, that's just it. or it's not a life until a certain point. It's like that. That argument wasn't even made when when Roe was passed. And to watch people cheer stuff like that, to watch people just you know make arguments that. As long as it doesn't violate the precious non-aggression principle, then it's fine. Then it can't do any damage. I mean, these people, you know, and there's there's that meme, we live in a society. So well, we do live in a society. And if you don't think that society is actually damaged by 
degeneracy, watching abort, you know, abortion on demand, things like that. Um, Drag queen story hour. Um, I don't know if you saw this, that high school that did the drag show in Philadelphia the other day, and they didn't even tell the parents and they did it secretly after school and someone filmed it. I mean, what, what's the libertarian answer to this? What? Oh, I, I know what the libertarian answer is. End public schools. Right. Come on. Come on. Come on. The f- well, and that's the thing is they yell these really impotent solutions that are not going to happen, like you're saying. But then they're more than willing to rush to the defense of like Disney and it's, you know, tax carve outs when <clears throat> sorry, uh, when DeSantis pushes back against them. So these people who are, you know, all for the free market and, and that's kind of thing are suddenly super on board with protecting a corporation, getting a specific, uh, you know, tax handout uh, only only for them. As you know, because otherwise, then it you know it's, it's somehow like an imposition on the right of the of the corporation's speech. It, it's just you know that's why both you and I use the term regime libertarian, right? Because I you know, think it really captures what these people are. They're, whenever it's time for them to mouth like empty platitudes, uh, they're they're there to do it. But as soon as there's any actual chance that they might have to run afoul of power, it's immediately, oh, well, no, this is just the right of in a, an individual or a corporation being reflected through what the regime wants, right? They're, they're, they're always there to rush in and protect this stuff. Yeah. And somebody was, I can't remember who said it. It was, it, somebody sent me a message or it was private and somewhere in the last 24 hours. I get a lot of messages. Um, I said, the job of the libertarian is to come up with tech, concentrate on tech, concentrate on the next thing, and let people who are willing to do violence handle politics. Libertarians do tech. Other people over here, they're going to do what needs to get done in order to stop where we are. And that, that makes a lot of sense to me because they're libertarians are i mean i've literally heard a conversation between three libertarians and they were talking about how you know when they come to load you on the box car that's when you that's when you it's okay to shoot to shoot back and i'm like you're not even going to shoot back then you're just talking out of your ass you have no solutions to how to stop that from happening. I mean, what was your, what were you going to do when, you know, if the jab came for you, you were going to take it. And yeah, I just don't know how people are still in this mindset of, I, I literally know people who think that like, and Kapistan could happen in this lifetime. And and I'm just in their lifetime. And I'm just like, where, do, where have you gotten this from? How, how did you come by this? I mean, where I, I've never thought that I've said that maybe on a small scale, we could have like a private city or something like that. And I still believe that that could actually happen in my lifetime where it wouldn't be completely private, but it'd be heading in the right direction. But it'd have to be something really small. it would be something really concentrated. And it'd have to be in the perfect area and have to be at a perfect time when the government is just completely weak and they're just, they're handling other things. But for to believe like, you know, it's like libertarians and the whole thing. Well, open borders is the libertarian policy. And I don't even need to argue like Hoppe arguments or anything. All I can ask, all I have to ask is if you think Ancapistan is going to happen in your lifetime, are those 10,000 Haitian males between the ages of 21 and 35 crossing the Rio Grande coming here to help you establish it? And I'm just a bad guy for asking questions like that. Well, like you said there, I think there's a lot of perfect, right? Like if this perfect thing happens, if that perfect thing happens, you know, if, and, and that's kind of always the issue is it's just kind of for libertarianism is just, well, you just kind of, you know, have these ideological better than, 
better than you positions waiting for you know the perfect thing to kind of assemble itself and and then you know the people will realize the beauty of your theoretical state and or lack thereof and you know, things will kind of fall into place and so there's no reason to like dirty your hands with like you know figuring out how to like actually better the lives of people and family and and community in between because well you know eventually like just the superiority of freedom will kind of make itself self-evident and and you know the the purity of the arguments will reorder kind of reality or society the way it needs to get done and i think that's that's really tempting on a lot of levels i, I don't think that only exists unfortunately in libertarianism i think that can easily exist kind of in my sphere as well and so i i think that you know, libertarianism is maybe a little more prone to it because they they so often don't think much about the community unless they're maybe in the Hoppe uh, tradition, uh, and and so they you know they they don't think about those needs and of of those outside of themselves, but they're still kind of always waiting for this theoretical thing to kind of reconfigure itself. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about kind of like uh, you said, kind of that last part now because I've seen a lot of people um you know kind of uh, talking to you on twitter or in general and it sounds like you get plenty of these messages in private too you know just kind of oh you betrayed your audience you know you were a libertarian podcaster you've betrayed your principles because you know you're looking at this other stuff and you're you're not just spouting things about the nap or you know about uh, uh about kind of libertarian economics and that means that you you just abandon your principles and your audience and whatever. And and I yeah I said something on Twitter and and I think it's it's true. It's like you would be a much more disingenuous hypocrite for just sitting there on an idea and a, and kind of a, a a pile of theory that you don't think actually works that you you know has failed, and just sitting on it and repeating it just so you could like grift off an audience rather than saying like guys i don't think this actually works i know you came along with me for the journey at this point but we're still moving together you know like i think that's a much more honest because there are plenty you know you there are plenty of people who make a great living just sitting on failed ideologies and shilling for them right like there's tons of bread tubers and marxist podcasters and people on fox Jonah news Goldberg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah like just the, you know people selling the neoliberal vision you know uh, there, there's plenty of people who are just stopped on dead ideologies and are still shilling them to the audiences that they, uh, you know, they kind of surrounded themselves with initially, uh, just kind of basically, you know, putting these people on life support until kind of the lights go out. And you're not willing to do that. And I think that kind of speaks to integrity. And I, I hope it's something that your your audience appreciates, because like I said, it would be very easy for you to just hit the pause button, stay exactly where you were when you got enough people following you to kind of do your thing and say, you know, this is what the people want to hear. I'm a showman at the end of the day and just do that. But that's not what you're doing. And I respect that. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, it 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 has caused me monetarily uh, it caused <laughs> loss monetarily, I would say in six months ago, I was I've probably lost 40 percent of my income from six months ago. And I rely on you know, all of my income comes from people donating. So, yeah, I mean, I could have stayed. I mean, I would be making, <laughs> I, I don't even want to think about how much money I'd be making right now if I would have just stayed a good little, you know, servant and, and mouthpiece for the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus and getting flown to talk at places and stuff like that. I, I mean, I, that was nice when I was doing it, but it's, I, I can't lie. I can't lie about what, what's happening in the world and who I am, you know? So I am, you know, and one of the criticisms I get is, well, it's like, well, you, you know, first you were an ANCAP, then you talked about agorism and then you went Mises caucus and now it's neo react, you know, now it's neo reaction and everything. And it's like, you realize that like okay first of all the world's changed in the last 26 months second of all it's like as i get more information i just you know look at different things differently the 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 one mistake out of all that stuff was just the agorism thing 
because I was con trying to convince myself in my head that agorism could actually bring down the state, which it just can't. It, it just that's just such a and it's and and is an ideology that is leftist um, to the core. So that's a, that's a huge problem. But the biggest problem I would say that libertarianism has is it's an identity because it has no power and because libertarians have no power no political power they can't elicit any change they can't do anything in the world that their being right and being able to say i told you so about a lot of different things it becomes their identity i think a lot of people come to um a lot of people come to libertarianism who are have like no identity a, there's a lot of single a lot of single men, a lot of single women, um, uptick of homosexuals and childless people, guilty right here. And they, you basically come to libertarian, people adopt it as their identity. So when someone like myself, who it was a fairly big voice in libertarianism, basically starts challenging it and saying this doesn't work i mean it may be moral but what the hell does that mean if you're getting you know if your life is being destroyed what is this morality and basically i think a lot of libertarians are scared there's a lot out there who are questioning it in their minds but they've made it their identity and they don't want to get they don't want to lose dm group they don't want to they don't want to get attacked by the in group. They don't want to get pushed out. And I just really don't care, you know, about, about that. You know, it's like, I've been pretty much a loner my whole life. So it's like, now I'm starting to, now that I've left libertarianism, I'm starting to understand community and people of like values and people of like mind, but like values more more than anything and you know that's what's important to me i, I think that's if, if i could tell you know it's one thing that i really get attacked for for calling libertarians out for is it becomes their identity it'd be i'm a libertarian i'm not a i mean i'm not in anything anymore i'm just i mean if you if pushed okay i'm a right winger you know but now at this point but my i'm going to call myself something that also includes like people who are completely for abortion completely for open borders um people who are just leftist degenerates and i forget who said this and it makes a lot of sense to me is that libertarian like a lot of libertarianism is like seeking progressive ends through libertarian means mm -hmm. and that's what i see when i you know, once you once i really start looking at what liberalism and classical liberalism is is i see progressivism i see how we got to where we are right now and you know classical liberalism is I still have people, you know, oh, I'm a classical liberal. You know, I'm not even a libertarian anymore. I'm a classical liberal. Well, sorry, but, you know, you're part of the problem, you know, because your classical liberalism is like the ultimate live and let live. So, you know. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, De Juvenal talks about this. He says that uh, whether it's the ideology of radical individualism or the idea of of radical collectivism they always arrive at the same place which is the total state you know both of these things are working from from different sides to to end up here because if you because whether the radical collectivism dissolves the community and family or whether the radical individualism dissolves community and family once those competing spheres of influence are gone the only thing left is the state and it will rush in to fill the void and the problem is libertarianism assumes that it won't right is that once it's gone it's gone you know it's gone and then then everyone just lives free in individual lives but that's not how it works and i think that you know what you're describing a lot with kind of the community is uh, 
a lot of times we forget what ideologies were supposed to be for, right? The ideologies were not supposed to be gods to themselves. They were not goods to themselves. They were good if they served the needs of the community, if they were good, if they, if they ended up producing a better world for the people who they were working for. But because we've created this situation where like, competing ideologies are the only thing are kind of the battlefield of the day we end up identifying ourselves not as community members neighbors members of a church members of a family but as ideological combatants and when you do that you lose the purpose that the ideology was constructed for in the first place and that leads you to all kinds of really dangerous and 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 dumb things like you know saying that oh well it doesn't matter what what my ideology produces as long as it's freedom right <laughs> i don't care what the freedom is for i don't care if it's in pursuit of kind of some kind of virtue i just want it to this i notion of freedom radically and on its own yeah i remember jeff deist president of the mises institute asked on twitter it's probably 2018 he said um okay anarchists if you could have anarchy tomorrow, but the default culture was one that was opposite of yours, would you want it? And I thought that that was a very insightful question and probably went over a lot of anarchist heads. Mm. You know, that was one of those things that um, one of those things that became a worm, you know, a brain worm that just stayed there. And I, and I kept thinking about that over and over again, um, because, you know, it was like at the time I'm listening to it and I'm like, well, if it was hoppy and would I really like it and everything like that. And I'm like, oh, no, no, that's not what he was asking. Oh, no. He was asking, um, you know, would a leftist kind of anarchy survive? Would it thrive? would people be able to live and that, you know, it's just things like that, that just, um, and I mentioned this on, on a live stream I was doing the other day that, um, I heard a, another thing that like set me off of my libertarian phase was I heard a debate on abortion between Dave Smith, Walter block and this, left libertarian from California. Her name is Abins O'Brien. And for the sake of not grossing everybody out here, um, she some of the stuff that she was describing from an abortion that she had basically pushed me to the right about three spaces. Mm. Um, because it was just it was the typical libertarian who is like, it's all about me. Um, I don't care if everybody else dies as long as I have freedom. And you see that constantly. You see that in a lot of the, the regime libertarians, a lot of the a lot of the libertarians this week that when you watch the comments under um, the Roe v. Wade stuff who are just like, you know, this just goes to prove that the right wing was more authoritarian, was the most authoritarian the whole time. You know, and I'm just like, yeah, last two years, huh? Yeah, no one yeah. not paying not paying attention to that at all. So yeah, this is the one thing, the one thing you noticed. Yeah, this yeah, is the, yeah. <laughs> well, because well, because abortion is abortion and open borders are libertarian sacraments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you don't accept those, then you're not a libertarian. You're a right winger, and right wingers can't be libertarians. Yeah, I made a, a prediction as soon as that decision handed down. And it was like basically expect all the like IDW, anti woke, uh, leftists, you know, the the Sam Harris's, the the James Lindsley, like expect all these people to the, the Eric Weinstein's, the Brett Weinstein's, like expect all these people to flee. Like expect them to all run home to the progressives. Sure. Um at because this will be a bridge too far. Like they they were okay to be heterodox on 
you know, um, woke stuff and, and maybe trans kids or something, but the row will be what sends them home. Like, because at the end of the day, like that is too holy a sacrament to touch. Um, and, and so I think there is a lot of reality that's settled in for, like you said, for people who had watched everything that's been happening over the couple of years and, and how the alignments were in theoretically shifting and, and that kind of thing. And then it all it takes is just one of these core button issues and all these people who have been whining on and on about, we can't focus on the culture war. That can't be the, co- the focus. Oh, this is just a bunch of made up hysteria about the culture war. All of a sudden, all that went away and they snapped right to attention. And it turned out that actually at the end of the day, when you put these people to the question, the answer is actually this, the culture war is what matters to me. And once you trip the, the right trigger, I'm immediately on side. I um, had a conversation probably six months ago. A lot happened six months ago. And I went through a bad relationship, too. That was uh, that opened my eyes to a lot of different things, too. I hadn't I never had one in my whole life and um, and had one made public. But the I was talking to a a leader in libertarianism and they told me that the culture libertarians need to make their own culture. And I'm like, so how are you going to do that? If you're not taking over government, how, how are you going to create a culture unless you have the tools to do it? I'm, I just don't understand how that would, what they're thinking and I, I think what they're the problem is is they just don't have the necessary mental tools to understand what they're saying when it comes to culture. You know, they're and also and I'm somebody who is guilty of using the Andrew Breitbart line of poli, you know, politics is downstream from culture, which is exactly the opposite. Mm-hmm. And now that I understand that, it's like I'm trying, I'm screaming into the void, telling these people, look, come on, you don't understand that the culture is the way it is because of the government. The culture wouldn't just become what this, you know, what this left insane culture is on its own. It's their outside forces are doing this. Don't you understand this? And they, I, I don't. I don't know if it's a just not being able to understand or like I said before, just being so invested in an identity. And you know, I I see it all the time. And it's just libertarians aren't gonna change anything. I mean, the libertarian party, if the libertarian party was run by hardcore hoppians. The Libertarian Party couldn't get anything accomplished. It's just it, they won't. It's a third party in a country that is a two-party country. I don't care who's running it. I don't care if the most based people are running it. It it just won't do anything. And there is this belief in so much of libertarianism because some of their heroes have told them that if they take over the Libertarian Party this like Ron Paul revolution is going to restart. And, you know, I have trouble saying this because of, you know, because it's, I, you know, I became a libertarian because of Ron Paul, but you know, the Ron Paul revolution was a failure. I mean, if there's one thing that may have been inspired by the Ron Paul revolution was maybe Bitcoin. Maybe that can't, you know, maybe Ron Paul inspired that the whole meltdown in 2008. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I'm here. There's a bunch of libertarians are here. But what have we done? The world has just marched on getting worse and worse and worse. You know, I wrote about that this morning in my sub stack where I'm just like, normally in my sub stack, I'm either railing against something or I'm trying to give people hope. And this morning it was one of those ones where it's like, it's really bad, people. Things are really, really bad. And, you know, we it's time to rethink some things again. And well, yeah. 
Well, I think you're right that a lot of people have been sold this understanding of power because it kind of makes losing it's it's managed to decline, right? Like if as long as I misunderstand like the relationship of power to what's happening around me, I don't actually have to think about it or think about why the strategy that's been sold to me is like destined to lose, right? And this is so much of, of both what the Republican and the Libertarian, you know, parties exist to do is like basically like cater the proper type type of defeat to to their audience. And so, you know, you like you said, you have this this idea of politics is is downstream from culture, uh, which makes a lot of sense and is like a revolution for a lot of people on the right, you know, five, six years ago. They they really thought that this was an amazing thing. But then you look at kind of the Roe decision and you look at how people responded on the left to the idea that Roe could fall, right? Like this was just a, a non, I mean, they, they used this to scare their base, but it's never something that they ever believed, right? And I don't think, or if they thought that it could, it would be like tactically after, you know, uh, they'd had a federal law passed or something. And so the idea that this thing could fall immediately starts seeing like just this, a deluge of articles talking about how well like if this decision can go then that means like you know Oberfeld can go and then it means you can lose gay marriage and you can lose all these lgbtq rights and 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 all this stuff and like basically like every one of these progressive uh you know uh shelling points can like suddenly be done overnight uh, undone overnight and the funny thing about that is like that's basically a mission saying like well, basically all the progressive cultural progress that we've seen over the last 50, 60 years has largely been from these top down, uh, you know, strong arm, poorly legal reasoned, you know, civil rights laws. Like you, people think it's all cultural. They think it's all bottom up. They think it's orga organic movements that end in these legal decisions. But like you said, they're not. These are this is manufactured culture. You know, culture, you know, law or uh, culture is downstream from power, and then uh, and and then maybe politics is at the end. But you know, it's the power that manufactures these culture outcomes, and it's like I said, it's very difficult for these people to think about it in that framework. It's a lot easier to just. Uh, to, to continue to think that power works the the way that they did before, because then they can just leave it hands off. They don't have to think about like, actually, no, someone has to steer the ship of state. Like someone has to be involved in these things. So someone's hand is always going to be on the tiller. And if it's not yours, it's someone else's that all requires effort and, 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 you know, getting your hands dirty and, and figuring things out and, and, and winning and th those are all far more complicated when you can just construct the perfect theory and then you know sit behind it waiting for it you know to come about because people will eventually realize you know the truth or something like that sure the yeah and what i think of when i think of power and where power comes from i think of like you know who ray kurzweil is uh i've heard the name but i can't immediately draw it to mind he's probably for decades been the leading voice on transhumanism. Okay. And you know, you you're like, most people will look at Ray Kurzweil and they'll be like, okay, this is the guy, this is the guy. No, Ray Kurzweil does, wasn't a billionaire. Who's who's funding him. It's, and these are questions that people don't ask. It's not, I mean, Ray Kurzweil has flown all over the world to speak. Who's doing this? Who, who's, who's the man behind Ray Kurzweil? And that's one thing that libertarians, you, you bring that up to a libertarian and they're like, well, it just sounds like conspiracy theory. It's like, well, this guy doesn't have all, doesn't have the kind of power to do this. Or, you know, like who's the, the new guy, Harari? And the one who's talking about how, you know, humans are hackable, things like that. Um, mm. These people, they they don't have somebody is behind them. Somebody is is doing this. And Harari is one of these. I mean, he's just World Economic Forum. That's where he's getting his money. Where are they getting their money for? Where are they get? Where's their money coming from? You know, and libertarians are like, they think that if they... <laughs> If they can just get enough people to read Murray Rothbard, that that goes away. And it's just like, um, what I, I don't, 
and I think it's just a lack of education. You know, it's like when I, you know, one of the first books I read when I came out of all this was, you know, the Machiavellians. And you read the Machiavellians and you're like, why haven't, why isn't this a libert? Why isn't every libertarian taught to read, told to read this? And it's like, well, <laughs> because it talks about the real world. <laughs> it's, yes, it's theory. There's a lot of theory in there, but it's theory that you can see operating in the real world. You can see its hand moving pieces on the board. And you know, that's just, it's another one of those things to, that goes towards if you don't know how things operate in reality, and I was, th this was a part of my sub stack this morning, and it's a conversation I've been having with a friend of mine, and we're going to have on my show pretty soon is, so there are a lot of Christians who have become political over the last five, six years because of Trump and everything. These are people who believe in God. They also believe in demons. Okay. And they believe demons will, in, will attack you, can take people over. How is that not something that people have worked into their political theory as well? How, how are they not thinking about that? And that's when she said that, I was like, there's so much that we just haven't, that there's so much that people don't take into consideration because they think that politics is like A and B, and then, you know, equal C, A plus B equal C. And it's, maybe you can get to a level where that can exist, but if you, if you dig down deep enough, but you can't look at this as something that's very simplistic. And I think that that is something that, you know, liber that one of the reasons why, you know, libertarianism just doesn't have the appeal to me anymore is because I'm operate. I'm seeing things in the real world, and seeing how things are operating, and I, there's nothing there for liber. Nothing in libertarianism provides an answer or a solution to why this is happening, or how and how this is happening, how to stop it. Well, you, you said it before, and I think it's it's largely true, right? There's a reason libertarianism is for autistic white guys, right? It's because it's people who want to turn politics into a math equation. You know, I've, I've set up the proper economic system. I can best engineer this this thing. And then once I've got the perfect machine set up, then uh, we, uh, we let it go. And then everybody gets to live under this umbrella of freedom because they're no longer, you know, the, it's, it's a government by steam, right? To, to borrow uh, Thomas Carlyle's phrase, right? Like once, once it's set up, the government will run itself or, or lack of government, whatever, you know, we'll, 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 once we've got this thing perfectly figured out and the theory laid out, we've got everything perfectly done on the spreadsheet. It's nice. It's clean. It's clear. I can understand it. It makes sense to me as someone who doesn't really want to deal with like feelings or human beings as like anything other than just a widget that I can properly kind of insert into a machine and hit play. But like you said, the real world isn't like that. That that's not how the real world works. The there there are levels of things operating that are far outside your uh, you, you know your small uh, philosophy. And if you try to stay inside it, you'll you'll just lose every time. You know, every philosophy, piece of philosophy, if you stare long enough at it, it just disappears, right? Like it, it just because the real world is just too complex. Those lenses are valuable. They can help you focus on certain aspects and and grasp them. Even a book like the Machiavellians, which I agree with you, is amazing. And every and like every and it's ridiculous. Like you truly get to understand. Because, you know, I, I studied political theory. I, I loved it before I got to the Machiavellians and I had never heard of this stuff. And I'm like, I read this book. And I'm like, this explains everything way better than everything else I've ever read before it. And, you know, I'm, I'm in like my late 30s. How can this not, how could I have not run into this before? You know, how, how could something this clear? But even a book like that is not a book that really 
uh, explains everything. You know, like you said, there's, mm-hmm. there's far more dimensions involved here. And, and even the attempts to, to put things in purely Machiavellian terms, d- it doesn't work. Right. And mm-hmm. then, and, and that's not enough either, even though, again, it's a very valuable lens and there's nothing wrong with evaluating things uh, through it to some extent. And the, just the limited ability to reach beyond that and f- fully have an understanding of the world as it is, both metaphysical and, 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 and political theory and, and just realities on the ground of, of social and political interactions, like not being able to have a holistic view of that and instead trying to kind of make everything fit into one particular formula or theory uh, and just neatly and cleanly is, is always a mistake and leads you to, to making these you know, ridiculous errors that leave you impotent when in the real world when things come down to it. Sure. Libertarian um, political solutions are literally them walking into a daycare center and grabbing the toy where you put the blocks in that so they fit. So the triangle goes in the triangle and the square goes in the square and the circle goes in the circle. And, you know, if they want to break out of that, they can realize that they can actually take one of the circles, turn it sideways, and you can actually put it in the square. That's like a libertarian breakthrough where you, you realize, oh, so it, it's it's not this simple. There's other ways that you can do it. And then it's there. there's another way that the game is played. And the game isn't played as simply as I think it is. And that was probably probably understanding just how complex it was. Um, once you start reading all of those books, you know, Evola was another one that just, you know, blew me away when I started reading it. Now I'm reading Imperium. So it's like I'm down this rabbit hole of one step up, one step up. And everything I seems like everything I read is just pushing me to another place. And it just, it's taking me a lot further down the path and away from the cookie cutter. Well, if, you know, if, if the state didn't exist, then, you know, the free market would take care of everything. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work that way because, you know, it's, you're, you basically have to, one of the things that libertarians love to say about socialists or communists is a oh, real communism hasn't been tried or real socialism hasn't been tried. And then, you know, you bring up the fact that, you know, oh, real laissez-faire hasn't been tried either. And real anarchism hasn't, you know, real Ancapistan hasn't been tried. And they're like, well, but we know that'll work because we've been told. And it's like, all right, well, I mean, <sighs> You know, I, I just you know. <laughs> no, I hear you. you. You, you, know, you hear, you think as a right winger or as a libertarian, you're like, okay, the story about communism where we're all just gonna, you know, everyone will, will, you know, uh, you know, work to their ability and receive according to their need, and the government will structure the economy so everyone get what gets what's uh, you know necessary, and no one will want. And oh, that's so ridiculous! It's so ridiculous. That's that idea has never you know existed anywhere. Of course, that'll you know that wouldn't work. And then you lay out you know a vision just as silly when it comes to like a, a more libertarian vision. It's it's hard for people to to grasp that it's it's just as theoretical it's just as detached from reality and and how the world actually operates but um but you know that's your it's your vision it's your uh you know your utopia and so it's you know the, this one will work even though it's so easy for you to dismiss the 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 opposite mirror version of that yeah i mean i i came up with this phrase last year that really really upset a lot of libertarians and especially um anarcho-capitalists was um stop living in ancapistan in your head and basically what it was is like you know if something about schooling comes up they will their answer to a problem with schooling is well just end public schools you know just end schools and or you know if um something foreign policy well just end the military get rid of the military and it's like 
and I still see this like on my timeline all the time. Yeah, you know, I see it on Facebook, I see it on Twitter, and it's just I mean, it's it sounds good, but it just goes to show that you have no one, you have no answers in the for the real world, and two, you're so ideologically possessed that to me well you just have to end the military is really like a virtue signal is you're you're signaling that you're completely against war you're completely against violence and you're completely against reality apparently because you know yeah. the history the history of the world is you know i mentioned this today interviewing somebody interviewing somebody in hungary the, you know, he was talking about how he he can't believe that it's the 21st century, that it's the it's the current year, and Russia invaded Ukraine, and I'm like, that's the history of the world, right? The history of the world is one country invading another, especially if there is some kind of ethnic, if there there's some ethnic similarity, there's some ethnic there's an ethnic thing going on there. It's like, how do you not? How do you not understand this? It's that Whig history, you know, that we've moved beyond it. You know, we'll, we'll eventually reach utopia where we're just going to continue to progress forever. And so we, you know, we thought we had advanced, you know, we're just going to keep moving towards the Star Trek world where, you know, uh, you know, we just uh, solve all the problems through technology and dissolve all the boundaries and the barriers. And there's no need for these petty human, you know, things anymore because we've just moved beyond them. And and that's really all it is. You know, people get weird about, re, you know, the term reactionary or whatever. And it's like at the end of the day, it's just an acknowledgement that like history isn't over. Uh, actually, like the all the things that existed, all the things you think you're petty that 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 were you're beyond those were animal things, or you know they're, they're backward and you, you're you're better than that, and you don't need to worry about those things anymore. They're all still still there, and you just you were just ignoring them and letting other people handle them for you. You were just naive. Uh, all, all it is is acknowledging that those things never went away, and they never will. And and that's a it's a mistake that a lot of ideologies make not just libertarianism yeah and one thing that you know i really learned from burnham in suicide of the west is that ideologies never manifest in reality so it doesn't matter if it's the right you know so the left ideology is oh we help the you know we help the downtrodden and we you know and the right is about you know protecting people's rights and you know less taxes and none of this stuff ever happens in reality so it's just basically a way and the people in charge know that it, know it is and you know i just think it's a way for them to get the plebs to repeat that have an ideology that they hang on to. And even though it never manifests in reality, um, you know, and one of those things that, you know, one of those things we learn from reading more and more is it just ideology just gets in the way. Really the only ideology that really matters is power, you know, this and power is not an ideology. Power is a, you know, it's a force. And until, people are desirous of it and you know one of the problems with like another problem with libertarianism is much like the communists see capitalism as being immoral you know the libertarians see power as immoral like nobody should have power you know it's like um it's like curtis has said you know you know said a bunch of times is you know, anarchists want they hate the idea of there being a sovereign yet mm -hmm. they want seven mil seven billion people to be sovereign and that's just absolutely insane i mean i just think of everyone you know and tell me that you know people that you would like to be see so be sovereigns their own sovereigns it's it's literal insanity well, and that was the promise of liberalism, right? Is the system will be sovereign. So we don't have to be ruled because we can all put our hands into this perfectly engineered system. And then the people will rule through the, you know, the, and they, they'll be free because, 
it, it's not an individual. It's not someone you have to trust or put your faith in or be loyal to. It's a it's a perfectly engineered system of checks and balances and, and constitutional rights and natural rights and all these things. And they'll check each other and they'll hold the, the, the forces at bay and and you don't have to worry about it. But of course, that was never true. And someone was always in charge behind the scenes. And the it turns out that you you can't cast the ring of power into Mount Doom like someone has to wield it. And, and if it's not you, someone else is doing it. And anything else that you were told is a lie to, to keep you under control. It was it, it was obfuscating uh, the way power worked so that you didn't ever sit down to, to play the real game. And uh, I think that's really hard for everybody, uh, libertarians included, to, to kind of understand. Uh, but we're we're over an hour here now, and I, I don't want to keep you forever. We've got some super chats lined up. Uh, guys, if you have a question for me or Pete, you can go ahead and uh, chat now. We're going to kind of run through these real quick. But if you want to sneak one in before we go, uh, you can still have time to do that. So Narco Republican for $2.00. Libertarianism is to men what feminism is to women. And yeah, I think there's there's a lot to that, right? Like it, they're manifesting in different ways, but it's this idea that I can be autonomous, I can be left alone, I can have my rights and do my thing and not have to rely on anyone else or care about anyone else. Uh, and and that, you know, that's what I should be guaranteed. Like I think there there is something to that in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, feminism sounds great until someone has to open up a stuck jar. Right. <laughs> Until there's a spider, you know. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Count uh, Arthur for $10. Thank you. Uh, still un uh, still an unreconstructed paleo-libertarian, but as Yarvin points out, too many of us lack the will to power. A libertarian regime is more like the win condition of the right, not an actual strategy. What do you think about that? I don't know all the gradations of libertarianism. I'm familiar with some of the terms, but uh, I, I certainly am not uh, in the the uh, think of it as much as you are. What do you think about that point? I don't understand what the ter what um, the win condition of the right is means. Um, yeah, libertarian regime is more like the win condition of the right. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I guess maybe like that's where the right is trying to go, but it's not a way, but it doesn't tell you how to actually get there, which. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think I that's mean, what's being applied there. Yeah. It's yeah. I use this all the time as the underpants gnomes from South park. Yeah. You, know, you collect underpants and then you get profit, but well, how do you get, how do you go from point A to point B right. or from point A to point C? Sure. You know, what's in the middle? Well, I mean, and you know, obviously it's distribution on South Park, but still libertarians have no idea how to get no libertarian has been able to tell me how to get from a drag queen story hour to see liberty. And the prop but the problem is is a lot of libertarians will say the drag queen story hour is liberty. Yeah, A is C, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, Daniel Robinson for $5. Thank you very much. Ideology is a crutch for political uh, mediocrity and supports oligarchy rather than competent government. Russia's government is now non-ideological and ours should be too. And yeah, I think there's, I, I don't know if that maps one-to-one, -one, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. Like I said, I, I think uh, when you don't have a clear vision of what's good for the people, when there isn't a driving singular force that is working towards a vision of the good and 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 what will benefit the people that it knows it's working for then you end up with these kind of devolved ideological warfare and so as, as long as people are busy arguing about ideology and whose ideology is best and which side should rule with what ideology and rather than talking about like what is good the good for the people what the common good is generating a common understanding of that kind of thing i think you're kind of always doomed to failure and and until you that's why the caesar figure is always kind of the you know the point of discussion a lot of this stuff right because the caesar figure kind of collapse all those discussions about ideology and oligarchy and and kind of you know kind of fashions in th uh, the uh kind of kind of this uh quest for the what's the good of the people rather than what's good for these individual interests or at least that's what's you know people like spangler saw it as sure and 
you know, one thing that this whole Russia thing, you know, should really point out is, and you know, this comment here does a good job of saying it is that once the bullets start flying, it's not ideological anymore. Now it's goal oriented. And, you know, it's <laughs> ideology gets in the way. You know, I mean, maybe this was started over some kind of, you know, I, I've listened to, Unlike a lot of people, I, I've actually listened to what Putin has said about why this is happening and why he did this. And, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't be taking him at face value because, you know, he's a liar and, you know, he's Putler and everything. But, you know, I'm listening to what he what he's saying. And this sounded like it started out with a, with with an ideal an ideological idea about, you know, NATO, the neoliberal encroaching neoliberalism. But now it's um, now we're down to the practical and it's interesting to watch that. It's interesting to watch how to see how people are reacting to it, because most people since this started on February 23rd, February 24th, have taken a distinctly emotional view of what's happening and they aren't you know, asking why. And to see if there's any ideology in it, to see if it's just a power move. And yeah, it's, it's eye opening when you, now that we have a war that we get, you know, an invasion that we can look at. Cause I mean, when the United States does their invasions, it's not a real invasion. It's a, yeah. It's a police action or it's a, it's kinetic action, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. A lot of people, kind of speculated on, on kind of Duganism and does this kind of Eurasian uh, empire type uh, idea, this plurality, does that play into it or is it all purely Machiavellian and practical? And I think the always, the answer is kind of always both. Like people mm -hmm. want everything to be one thing. They, they want, again, they just want to reduce things to very simple motives and, you know, they want Putin to be a creature of one type or another um, and I think that there's kind of always a mistake to try to do that. Yeah. Um, enlightened despot here for $14 in, uh, in, uh, leaf money. Thank you very much. Uh, politics shouldn't be so painful. Obviously it's been tough, but it's time to move forward. I've never been a libertarian, so I really don't get it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think we're required, you know, that that's the feeling is politics has to be painful, right? Like the system, that we're all kind of stuck in right now demands that it be painful, right? Well, everybody has to care about politics all the time because that's how the state keeps power, right? By like keeping, pu keeps pushing on kind of these hot button issues to keep people focused on what it wants. Like this is, this is kind of how democracy works, right? By like constantly uh, keeping uh, everyone, you know, wrapped attention onto these issues and then, and you know, the, by controlling what people care about and what they think about all the time, that's how you stay in power. And so I think it, it's, you know, necessarily engineered to be that way. Uh, but uh, you know, ho hopefully not always, but I think, uh, I think that's a key part of the regime and kind of how they keep power. Yeah. I like the, the line here, but it's time to move forward. Um, that can mean a lot of different things, you know, and, when I look at something like that, I think, well, it's time to try to come up with ideas, short term and long term. And I think that's one of those another one of those things that, you know, you just don't get out of libertarianism is everything is theoretical and you. OK, what can we do in the meantime to mitigate what's happening and how is it solved, you know, long term? And, you know, those aren't those aren't convert possibly one or the other can be had in libertarianism, but normally the, the short term has a lot more can exist in reality a lot more than the long term. you know, like, okay, well buy Bitcoin. Okay. That's good. Cause Bitcoin's eventually going to take down the state. Okay. Hold on. I, I, I like the first part about buying Bitcoin. <laughs> the second part um, we're, we're going to have to talk about that. All right, let's see. Daniel Robinson here for $2. Monotheism emerged under extreme wealth inequality. Um, I guess. I don't know, like almost all of human history 
exists under extreme wealth inequality. But yeah, yeah. I mean, you could make the. I mean, monarchy emerged under extreme wealth inequality. Right. <laughs> Humans emerged under wealth yeah. inequality. Yeah, that's not particularly useful. I don't think. Um, let's see. Uh, Narco Republican for five dollars. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that properly. Ibn Khaldun destroys the liberal myth of the individual. Look into his concept of. Uh, I'm awesome, again. Yeah. Okay, sure. And uh, by the way, he's also into cyclical theory of history. All right, I have not heard of that gentleman. Uh, well, actually, the the name sounds familiar, but I don't know anything about it. So, but I will. I will the, the reading stack is so tall at this point, and I, I love I love it when people bring me new things that I need to get through. Uh, but man, I, I I've one day one day I feel like the guy from um, the Twilight Zone, you know, like he just needs more time to read, and then he breaks his glasses at the end of the world, yeah, and yeah. he can't read anything. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, I watches the Watchmen for ten dollars. Can you guys try and get AA on Good Old Boys to talk about his populist delusion book? Well, wasn't he on your show recently, Pete? Yeah, he was. He was on recently. Um, it was a great, very well received episode, and um, actually, a lot of the stuff that he talked about, even I had to make some tweaks in my thinking um, with some of the things that he talked about. But yeah, I really would like to see AA talk to those guys. No, so, I think that would be very interesting. Yeah, I, I just yeah. got. The, the first run of the book sold out immediately, so I didn't get that one, but uh, my my copy should be coming in the next couple of days, so I'm looking forward to digging into that. I think AA will be on my channel here um, in, in the next coming weeks. We'll figure out something so he can talk about more, but yes, I would be very interested in hearing that interview, so uh, you know, if, if Bog and Merrick are out there somewhere uh, you know, uh, making that happen, I think everybody would appreciate that. That uh, would be an that would be a great conversation. Uh, let's see. Uh, sale foam for ten dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, love to see Pete engaging with reactionary right. I found Pete three or four years ago listening to Dave Smith. It's fascinating to see how many former libertarians end up moving this direction. Yeah, they. Um, well, I, I guess the 2016 version of. The 2022 version of libertarians moving to the reactionary right is the 2016 version of libertarians moving to the alt right. The, the pipeline, the yeah, the, pipeline. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Heath here for ten dollars. First ever chat. So sorry if it's a crappy take, but <laughs> simple game theory shows libertarianism to be unworkable. If your enemies have power, you must have power to respond no man that's a perfectly good chat thank you for yeah. uh, for your uh, donation and yeah i know that sounds really simple and it, it and it is but it it's the i think i think like pete said a number of times it's that beautiful theory that is so you know it's so uh it draws you in right it sets you up and you don't think you really need those things even though you know a really simple analysis kind of makes it obvious that it is. I, I say this all the time. Like, I don't say anything particularly profound on Twitter. I, I don't really don't. I don't come up with a lot of new ideas. I just repeat really obvious things that everyone is like too advanced to say anymore. Like, and I think that's true in a lot of ways. Like, yeah, it should be very obvious. Like he said that, like, if you don't have power, your enemies will beat you. Cause that that's the tweet, right? Like, the people who want to win will always be the people who want to be left alone. Um, and, and that seems really obvious. And, and I think it is, if you're not steeped in a lot of kind of lists, myths about liberalism, but we, we swim in those myths. Those are the things we're taught from very young where we, we live in that religion. And so it's very hard to us for us to see the obvious outside of it, I think. Yeah, it's, I don't know how many times I've seen libertarians talk about how power is immoral and that should just be just that person should be dismissed. I mean, it, what's funny is you will hear a lot of libertarians say we're not because of the non-aggression principle, we're not pacifists. But honestly, if it comes 
if you're not willing to grab power to respond to power, you're a pacifist. You're just waiting for you're waiting for to be smashed. And yeah, I mean, I just don't I've never understood pacifism. You know, I mean, I I guess I was punched in the face way too young and been in way too many fights when I was a kid. I just never understood pacifism. It's just not in my nature. And I've been saying for for a while now that one of the biggest problems not only in libertarianism but in society in general is most people most people haven't been punched in the mouth in their life. It cha- it, a good punch in the mouth will change you. No, absolutely true. I think, uh, yeah, have, having a, a relationship and an understanding of how the world actually works, uh, uh, that'll quickly wake you up to some realities there. Uh, let's see. Ron Fisher for $20. Pete's point about libertarians building tech and others doing other duties. Baptists, very strong. Has uh, Was the USA flawed from inception uh, not to have state religion? And is a state-promoted ideology necessary or inevitable? That's a really good question, Ronald. I like that question a lot. It's um, it, it's a, it's uh, one that people don't, I think, ask often enough. I don't know where other people still stand on this, but I remember very distinctly watching one interview with Curtis Yarvin where someone kind of put this question to him, like, do you think that, you know, you talk about, you know, kind of wokeism as a state church. Do you think that an actual state church is is kind of fundamentally necessary? Uh, And his answer was, yeah, I think it is. And the same thing, you know, uh, Nick Landis said very similar things said human beings are meant to be ruled by churches. You know, that that's just the way people operate and there's no way around that. Does that mean you have to have a state religion? I I think the answer is Im, is implicit, like yes, but it doesn't have to be formally and official. In, in like you don't have to have like the state and the religion be the exact same thing, right? Like I think we saw a lot of the strength of Western civilization be the fact that you know the the kind of had two pillars of this, you know, the pillar of the state and the pillar of religion, and the fact that there were competing social spheres kept the power of both in check in a very natural and organic way. So I think there has to be a religion that binds the people together. I think that's what gives people identity and meaning. So I think that is necessary, but does it do, does the state have to function or does the state have to function as a religion? Does the, do the people who run the state and the people who run the religion have to be the same people and share the same, you like unipolar thing? I don't think that necessarily has to be the case, but I don't know. I'm interested to hear uh, Pete's thoughts on that. Um, I think back to Austrofascism in the in the 1930s, and really the only reason I know so much about it is um, reading Mises, and Mises worked for the government um, at the time. And basically, what they were trying to do was they were trying to set up like a Catholic theocr- theocracy kind of thing. But they had they were not going to force people to um, become catholics it was just going to be it was going to be based off of catholic principles and you know it's funny i was talking to somebody if i mentioned their name everyone would know who they are and um the other night and they said yeah sounds pretty good right about now right and and um but state promoted ideology necessary and or inevitable um what I come back to is, and I saw I saw Charles Charlemagne in the chat a couple times here today. It was something that he said on on my show six seven months ago that um, you know if you are going to <clears throat> base your base everything off of you're going to base your society off of liberty. Well, you're going to have to be able to protect liberty. You're going to have to be able to jealously protect liberty. Um, if somebody wants a gay do a gay pride parade, you shut that shit down. You know, you say it's not going to happen here. And if somebody wants to teach communism, no, not unless you're teaching the the evils of it and how it will not be that that will not be instituted here. It will not be entertained in any way. And um, there's something in the Constitution talking about securing the blessings of liberty for our posterity, which is language that is very active 
but they didn't do it. And yeah, I think that state religion, you know, as long as it isn't, I've been going over some things recently for um, like intentional communities. And, I, you know, the idea that I have is that the intentional community would be based off of Christian values. Not everybody has to be a Christian, but it would be based off of like biblical values. So, yeah, I have no problem with that. I think that um, if the USA had been, you know, we, you know, how a lot of people say now, well, we, we were formed as a Christian nation. Well, no, we weren't. Um, if you had, maybe things would be different now. And if you would have jealously protected the ideology of quote unquote liberty, then maybe things would be different right now. But maybe things would be different now. But yeah. Let's see. Son of a glitch for $10. Seems libertarianism at this point is a or should be the utopian vision for recruitment only, the perfect communism of the right, a carrot for when you win, not a cul-de-sac to fall in the now. Uh, well, I understand what you're saying there, but I don't even think it's a particularly good selling tool at this point, right? Like, I think it was a, it was a, it was a story that you could tell yourself maybe 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and it still didn't make sense, but at least it sounded plausible enough at the time. Uh, I don't think you can tell yourself a libertarian story anymore. I think there are a few people desperately trying to kind of recapitulate it uh, to kind of safeguard the what's left of their liberalism uh, in, in a particular way. But I don't even think that's what people are interested in at this point. I don't think that's where the energy is for the most part, you know, but uh, especially on the right. But I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't I don't see trying to sell the perfect now or ever really. I mean, perfect is the enemy of the you know, that phrase perfect being the enemy of the good, don't let's perfect you know, become the enemy of good and you know, we uh, I, I disagree with Curtis what he was talking about in the live stream that we did with him about, you know, not having the these little victories. I think these little victories um bring or a good or a good recruitment tool and um but i wouldn't i wouldn't sell perfect because it, it's just like selling libertarianism libertarianism is selling the perfect and just concentrating on the perfect but we're not gonna we're not gonna have the perfect i've said you know we're not gonna have the perfect unless there's a shift in evolution or something like yeah you know, there would have to be some kind of evolutionary shift Spaceman Spiff for $10. Have either of you considered bringing up these objections to libertarianism to ANCAPs like Bob uh, Murphy, Tom Woods, or Brian Kaplan? I'm curious to see them respond to dissident right ideas. I mean, I mean yeah, I I'm sure idea. you have. Yeah. I, would, well, I mean, I was on Tom Woods' show presenting, you know, just saying, look, it, it just doesn't work. Yeah, and Tom agreed. You know, he had to agree. You know, he he was you know, one question that he asked was, well, you know, how, how far are you willing to go? Things like that, you know, but I mean, Tom, yeah, I have a, a great relationship with Tom and you know, we can talk about these things. Um, and he's somebody who's very open to talk to Brian Kaplan is, I mean, he, he's not the kind of libertarian and Bob Murphy is Bob Murphy is like the, the, the NCAP stand guy. He's like the, the legal, what legal theory, you know, how society would work in NCAPistan. I just don't see the value in having that, um, having a conversation like that in, um, when there's no chance of that happening. All we would be doing is arguing theory. And if I'm going to argue, if, if I'm going to sit, sit here and argue theory with Oren, it's going to be theory that actually like could work in the real world. <laughs> not you know not the fantasy that I sold for so many years. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not as familiar, obviously, with these people as you are, and but you know, in general, I'm, I'm happy to talk to them. But like you said, it sounds like you're you're far more familiar and connected to those things, and they're probably familiar with those arguments at this point. So, yeah. um, you know, they, I'm sure Pete Pete is the is the person to talk to there if they want to. But it sounds like he already has in in some ways. So sure, yeah. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, next one here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Alternator for $10 something. I'm not sure what the A there is, but thank you very much. 
it's me, Super Mario. Sorry, guys, I don't do uh, voices, but I, I will. I will read it out. Thank you very much. I think that's I appreciate Australian. That. I think that's Tim is Mario it Australian? Australian? Okay, it's so it's Fun Bucks. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, let's see. Next one here, uh, sale foam again for ten dollars. Thank you very much. Has any libertarian ever addressed how they might deal with China, Russia, Iran, etc.? It seems that libertarianism is just as total uh, uh, totalist as communism. They need the whole world on board. Yeah, th- I mean, that does seem like a real problem, right? Like, it seems like most of the uh, libertarian theory is just like, well, once we get America figured out, as if, like, the the geopolitical situation doesn't factor in at all. To be fair, there's a lot of that, though. Like, I will say that, like, neo-reactionary thought can be just as guilty of that. My, my buddy, the Prudentialist, um, who I think you've talked to as well. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he is a very good geopolitics guy and he makes this point all the time is, you know, people are so inward facing with the empire. They kind of pretend that like things just keep on moving, uh, or, you know, like they, they basically American can just exist in a bubble as it collapses and you don't have to factor in anyone else of what's going on, but that's not how it works. The world keeps turning. And if the hegemon falls apart, um, they're not just going to, you know, you can't just assume they leave you alone to, forever until you kind of recapitulate into the perfect ad and Kapistan that can, you know, kind of resist their, uh, their advances. Well, I think, well, let me try to answer this. Like I would have answered it four or five years ago. Um, well, if, if we did have in Kapistan, how we would deal with China, Russia and Iran is, um, we'd listen to Bastiat, Frederick Bas Frederick Bastiat and say, if goods don't, cross borders armies will and so we need to be we need to be trading with china russia and iran and because we trade with china russia and iran and trade always brings about peace then that's how we would deal with this yeah i do think that is the the answer right is like basically if you just make the world interdependent enough it solves all the problems right And so you don't have to worry about those things because if China and Russia are so desperately interdependent on, on the United States then, or, or our theoretical, you know, recapitulation of, uh, and Kapistan, then they, they won't be interested in, in uh, force. But again, and a kind of another barrier to how uh, uh, libertarians see the actual world and how it actually functions but okay, it looks like we've made our way through all of the super chats. So I want to go ahead and thank Easter Worshipper for uh, sponsoring this show. Guys, if you want to be uh, thanked personally for contributing and helping the show out, uh, you can check out my subscribe star. The links are below. I've restructured that. So there's a bunch of different things, including an exclusive video for people who are going to be uh, subscribed over there. I'm going to be putting out one per month, so you can definitely uh, check that out. Make sure, uh, again, anyone who hasn't heard Pete's Pete's show, obviously he has a lot of people that you're familiar with. You've heard us talk about uh, many of of our friends that have been on there, but he also has a bunch of other great guests. Very interesting, always worth watching so you should definitely follow all his links and check out all his stuff there pete is there anything you want to uh to kind of shill anything you want to make people aware of sure check out my show the piquinones show um piquinones.substack.com and um charles is having a heart attack in the in the um comments charles hit me up on telegram and uh tell me what tell me what you hard disagree with yeah, Charlemagne uh, usually shows up to the stream to to, to yell at either uh, us or the audience. So it's always <laughs> always worth checking out what, what he's on about. But uh, thanks for stopping by, guys. Uh, appreciate everyone who showed up and listened, everyone who was super chatting. Really loved it. Again, uh, once more, thanks to Pete. Uh, thanks to Easter Worshipper. And uh, really appreciate you guys. As always, I'll talk to you next time.